<laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Hank still packs a house, doesn't he? <laughs> All my life, people have been telling me to turn down my music. My father told me to turn down my music, my mother, neighbors, camp counselors, uh, husbands. <laughs> I would be playing the mamas and the papas on my little portable turntable at night. And when each night before I go to bed, my baby, my father would yell out, he would bark out, turn that racket off. <laughs> it would be the same day that I had been awakened by his music coming out of the television, gospel quartet music, the Florida Boys, on that getting up morning. So we, we sort of volleyed back and forth for a while. This is not, um, maybe that's part of the reason I wrote this book, is I could, in the name of duty, albeit pleasant duty, I could listen to music for a whole year as loud as I wanted to. And if anybody said anything to me about turning it down, I could just say, just trying to earn an honest dollar. So that's pretty much what I did. This is not a Hank biography. There are a lot of them out there. Some are poorly written and well-researched. Some are well-researched and poorly written. Some are made up entirely of whole cloth. So it was never my intention to try a Hank biography. What I wanted to write about is what sustains us. You know, life is a tough go, and we all get through it the best way we can. Some are sustained by religion. Some turn to alcohol. Antidepressants are a new popular way to, to get through life. I have this old Cajun fr fisherman friend, and his name's Greg Gerard, and he goes out into the swamp and crawfishes, but he also retrieves old cypress sinkers from the bottom of the swamp when the when the weather and the water is just right. And he's just the wisest, calmest man. And one day I said to Greg, you just seem to me a beacon of contentment. And Greg said, I'm a beacon of Lexapro. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to write about were th the things that sustain us as individuals. And for me, that has always been music. All of my life, music has calmed me, made me happy. Um, the, my, some of my first memories are of my grandmother rocking me and singing, I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. And my father especially loved music. He's the one I think I inherited my love of music from. And he, he didn't believe in um, complaining. That wasn't part of what he did. But you could tell when he'd had a, had a really hard day because he would go to the living room couch, the one nobody ever used, and he would prop his head on the pink pillow that Mother bought in Gatlinburg on, on one vacation and we weren't supposed to touch. <laughs> he'd put his feet on one end and that pink pillow beneath his head and he would say, come play me a little something. And he would ask my older sister first because she played piano better than I did. And she would dutifully go in, and she would play her recital pieces, and then she'd get tired. And I would march in, and I would play by Blue Lagoon and Country Gardens and my recital pieces. And by this time, Daddy would be fast asleep. And sometimes when he tired of our recital pieces, he would ask to borrow that little portable record player, and he would play his songs, his albums. And that included uh, Webb Pierce, I'm in the jailhouse now, and... Lots of Hank, always lots of Hank. But we grew up thinking, or I grew up thinking, that if you'd had a hard day, what you wanted to get home to was a little music. And I still do that. I can't tell you how many times music has gone with me chasing columns. And it, it's just been my solace all of my life. People, another reason I didn't want to do just a strict biography is people like to argue about the facts of Hank's life and death. Um, it's sort of like the way people argue about the Bible. You know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, that kind of argument. Uh, where was Hank when he died? Exactly when did he die? Exactly what killed him? Were Lillian and Audrey, were they the, wing, the wind beneath his wings or were they just two bats from hell? Uh, 
Was the Black Bluesman Teatot, was he the first musical influence of Hank's life or was it the shape note singing at the Baptist church? God or mammon? I don't know, and frankly, I don't even care. I hope everything that I've said is factual, but it's not so much about facts as it is passion. I'm more interested in not how he died as to why his music still lives. And so what I did was try to talk to some people for whom Hank hung the moon, people whose life he changed, influenced, enriched, from my father to Braxton Schufert, who was one of Hank's dear friends when he died, Um, just people that not necessarily knew Hank, but for whom Hank hung the moon. One is a Cajun woman singer, Helen Boudreaux, Helen learned to speak English by listening to Hank on the radio. Hers was a family in Catahoula, Louisiana, where they spoke Cajun French until she went to school. And when she was four, Hank started, they started playing a lot of Hank. And she loved his voice so much that she literally learned her first words of English from Hank Williams. So that's the kind of story I tell. There's a... Um, Hank impersonator, Hugh Harris, who was a prison guard at Angola Prison in in Louisiana. His story is pretty interesting to me. Um, I'm thinking that I want to read, somebody told me a long time ago, people who come to readings really don't want you to read, and so I keep it very short, but I do want to read a couple of short passages to give you an idea of the flavor of this book. From second grade through sixth, I attended Dalrada Elementary School in Montgomery, a typical red brick maze of an institution ruled by women and shaded by pines. It took up a suburban block right out of Ozzie and Harriet, if Ozzie and Harriet had had a little less money and lived near an airfield. I loved the school and felt exceedingly safe there from morning till three o'clock dismissal. Patrol boy Randy Slack, who wore a crew cut all the way through high school, would whistle me across the street and into a world of clean plate club buttons and thematically matching bulletin boards and high top socks held up around your knees with rubber bands. It was a forgotten time long ago before bullies and bullets enrolled in elementary schools and before the music died. Most of the time during music class, we simply sang songs of unbelievable horror, come to think of it, considering we were such innocent kids, With imaginary banjos on our knees, we sang of being shots in the streets of Laredo and of a grandfather clock that stopped when an old man died. That particular one gave me nightmares. I always pictured my own kindly grandfather, especially when we came to the part about his spirit was pluming his flight, his hour of departure had come. My grandparents had, in fact, a relentless mantel clock that was so much a fixture of their home, I don't remember it ever not tick-tocking. What if it were to stop? Thinking back on those songs, I'm reminded of a George Jones story he tells in his autobiography. His famous hit, He Stopped Loving Her Today, was tricky to sing, and George didn't like it to begin with. After flubbing several attempts in a recording session, he threw the music down in disgust. Nobody is going to buy this maudlin son of a bitch, the possum angrily predicted. Maudlin songs were part and parcel of elementary school music. There was the usual complement of Stephen Foster songs with angelic dead women and old black Joes, songs about train wrecks and sinking ships, dying Confederates and lost dogs. No happy, upbeat songs for us, no siree. Your ship sank, your dog ran away, and the Yankees won. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) You're saying, and I thought the book was about Hank. I think most of you in this room probably would agree with me how important music is. You know, to some people, music's not all that important. It's if they're riding up in an elevator and all music is the girl from Ipanema playing in a beige box and uh, being performed by the all-beige boys' choir. Then there's the rest of us. There's us. Uh, Music moves us, motivates us. It's why we buy a car. It's for the sound system. (laughs) It can make a long trip short. It defines an era. It's in our homes, our computers, and in our hearts. It's the be-all to end-all. So that much is settled. We're in agreement there, I think. But why Hank? 
Why is it Hank music that endures and comforts and that we identify with? Why is his music, 60 years nearly after his death, why is it still what we turn to, what I turn to anyway? Why not the Beatles or the Bee Gees or Booker T and the MGs? Why for me is Hank the ultimate musical savior? I thought writing this book might clear up the mystery for me, but it, it, it didn't exactly. The world's full of good pickers and singers and lyricists. John Prine, for instance, whenever I think of him, I think that he may be the best writer, the best musical poet since Hank. But somehow when Prine comes on the radio, I'm glad, but it's not the same as when Hank Williams Hank Williams comes on the radio. I don't care if you've heard the song 900 times. If you heard it yesterday, it is searing in its intensity. It's like watching Man of War lead the starting gate every time. There is something about the combination of his words, his music, and that perfectly imperfect voice that gets to us again and again and again. He wrote poetry. I mean, that much is established. Uh, He's called the Hillbilly Shakespeare. He knew somehow that a midnight sky was purple, not black or blue. It was purple. He knew that a heart was cold twice, not once but twice. He knew that a mansion had to be on a hill. He knew these things instinctively. He took very complicated matters of love and death and betrayal and made them simple. He put it down where the hogs could get to it. He resisted efforts to change his pronunciation of of words. He sang it like we talk it. He kept it on a level that people related to. My late husband, Don, and his ex-wife, are you confused yet? Uh, (laughs) This is Don Grison and his poet and English teacher uh, wife, Pat Grison, She taught English for nearly 40 years at Jackson State in Jackson, Mississippi, and they were both huge Hank fans. So about 35 years ago, uh, they decided to put out a call to their English teacher and journalism teacher colleagues and ask for submissions of poems or essays or short stories, anything pertaining to Hank, what Hank had meant to them what he had taught them about writing, just uh, anything about Hank. And they got a lot of return, things in the return mail. I mean, it flowed in. And then they went about and interviewed some of the usual Nashville suspects, who a lot of them are no longer with us. They interviewed Jerry Rivers, Hank's fiddler, and they interviewed um, Minnie Pearl and, and Tom T. Hall, and just anyone they could think of who might have a good Hank. And then the marriage ended, and the collaboration fizzled, and most of these interviews, which had been painstakingly transcribed on a manual typewriter for the most part by Pat, ended up in the attic of the little house I had in Louisiana. And after Don died and I had to sell that house, I was in the attic clearing out, and I ran across this box, which I knew existed, but I didn't know where it was, and I didn't, hadn't really been through it. And it just said, Hank. Well, I dragged it down from the attic. It was August. It was hot. I took it into the living room that was air-conditioned. And I spent the next couple of days just reading these quotes. And when I would ask Don, why don't y'all finish that book? He'd say, ah, it's all over the map. And it's true. It was a bit all over the map. But that was a good thing. Uh, People, they talked to, to... people who had hitchhiked to a Hank concert. They talked to people who had never known Hank but loved his word choice and cold, cold heart. I mean, it it clearly was a, a really diverse bunch of stuff. And I thought about it, and I hated to see some of the quotes go to waste. And I had always, all my life as a columnist, which is 30 years now, every time I'd write a Hank column, I would get such passionate mail every time and just hundreds of letters, who, people who felt the same way I did about Hank. And by passionate mail, I mean positively passionate mail. I get a lot of passionate negative mail too, but this, this was all very positive. 
but one of the consistent themes in in all this stuff that they had collected in the poems and the short stories and the letters and the memories was about Hank's staying power. Why? And, you know, again, during the course of three decades writing about the South, you, you pretty much write about every Southern icon there is. But the response was never the same as when you would write about Hank Williams. So why Hank, again? I don't think the composite is the answer uh, exactly, though it is very rare for somebody to write so well, sing so well, and be a musical genius with the tunes. But I don't even think it's, I don't think it's that. I think that somehow he, his genius is inexplicable, but it's there. He will be remembered in the same breath as Mark Twain, as an American writer, as Stephen Foster as an American composer, and Robert Frost as an American poet. And yet he mastered all three somehow in 29 years. And I'm just proud to have the Montgomery connection because of Hank Williams. He, Bob Dylan has said he was the greatest influence in his musical life. Again and again, unlikely musicians will say it was Hank who was the primary influence in, in their life. He is, I think, a torch to be passed from generation to generation. My father gave him to me. I remember the day so clearly in Nashville when my niece, Chelsea, and those of you who read the column probably hear about Chelsea more than you want to, but I'm very proud of her. We went to see a play about Hank, and Jason Petty was the young actor who played Hank, and Chelsea was smitten. We had lunch with this young actor, and she just thought he was wonderful. Then we went to the play that night, and it was really, I guess, the first time Chelsea had heard much Hank Williams' music. And she jerked Jewel out of her earphone so fast, <laughs> she, she became an all Hank, all the time kind of girl. And she, so I got, to, I got to watch that. I got to watch her conversion experience, and I guess my father got to watch mine. He is like Shakespeare in, in that he is of the ages. It's true we'll never get out of this world alive, but Hank will make the journey a whole lot more bearable for all of us who love his music. I want to read another short passage that's more about Hank than me. Why does the music live so long after his death, fresh as the day it was first written and sung? How could one man master a genre and hold the record forever? How did Hank do what he did, and why has his reputation grown surely and steadily for nearly six decades? Willie Nelson told me in a 2002 interview that nobody, but nobody, should ever expect to surpass Hank Williams. Nobody should even want to, Willie said. Anything we do that Hank already did will be less, so we have to try to do something else. And Willie has certainly done something else better than anyone else. <laughs> There was an element of luck in the fact that Hank made music at all. We think of genius as inexorable, water running downhill, but I suppose it really is not. In 1942, Hank Williams, age 19, went to work at a Mobile shipyard. The wartime army didn't want him. He had to make a living. Jimmy Buffett's mother, Pete's Buffett, unearthed Hank's application years ago while sorting old files at Alabama Dry Dock and Shipbuilding Company. I got to see a copy. There was something almost startling about seeing Hank's actual handwriting, akin to looking at Charlotte Bronte's longhand manuscript of Jane Eyre in the British Museum. Hank wrote in a sloppy hand on the official job application. Williams, Hiram, Hank, he wrote. For his address, he scrawled, None yet. Hank said he weighed 136 pounds, quote, without overcoat or hat, as the paper specified. He must have been fudging a little, judging from early photos, where he looks as thin as Kate Moss. Color of hair, brown. Color of eyes, brown. Complexion, sallow. <laughs> Young Hank must have been a little nervous when handed the thorough a four-page document that asked the name and address of all members of your immediate family, including immediate relatives of your wife. The application had been designed in wartime with an eagle eye for enemy sympathizers who might divulge secrets of the dock. 
Have you ever worked in a foreign country? That was question 25. Yes, Hank answered. In Mexico in 1940 as a musician, Hank's honest nature was apparent even in this bureaucratic format. He marked no when asked if he'd ever had a physical exam. And to question 23, have you ever been arrested? He wrote, yes, suspicion, last year, Montgomery, mistake. (laughs) So here was a kid who had been around, or to jail in Mexico at least. Now he was cooling his heels in a strange town, staying with his Uncle Bob, playing nights in waterfront taverns, and some say sleeping on the day job. Hank listed music as his hobby and said he had attended high school in Montgomery but never graduated, that he'd taken a bookkeeping course at a business college and been employed as a weekend painter and a musician at WSFA and WCOV radio stations in Montgomery. Why did he leave those jobs? This is some some questionnaire, isn't it? Contract ran out, Hank answered and he would leave the shipyard job in short order. After only three months working for 66 cents an hour as a ship fitter's helper, Hank told his bosses he needed to be closer to his mother, who was ill, and to his sister. The company wanted medical proof. Thank goodness Hank didn't waste much time welding widgets. His mother did, did him and the rest of the world a huge favor when she came to fetch Hank home. The story is not quite quite unlike that of the, it's not unlike that of the job of the great cartoonist Charles Schultz, almost accepted after the war, lettering tombstones. Fate really does pivot on fine points, doesn't it? I love that story for some reason, and I'm so glad that Lillian went and brought him home and that he did write music for us. I have a, just a couple of the quotes I wanted to share with you, and these were in the Hank box that I found in the attic. Pat Grison died the year before Don, by the way, and I uh, found the approval, got the approval of her family and estate to use the work they had already done. And I hope I give them lots of credit. This is a poem that I love by Charles Kingda. He spun his words around like planets in the universe of his cosmic country mind until they shone like stars, brighter than the fire of his eyes, but it was his voice. Oh, God, his voice that made the sun. And then this is Miller Williams. Miller Williams is the father of the famous singer Lucinda Williams. But Miller Williams is a poet in his own right. He was Clinton's inaugural poet, among other honors. He told Pat and Don Grison, As I know the South, Hank Williams was an almost perfect reflection of the South. The South that I knew, as I understood it, was hard-bitten, a world where you could not hope to succeed but to find something meaningful in your failure, a world in which the cards were stacked against you and there was a certain honor in playing them straight. That's the kind of thing that I couldn't leave in the box, but it, these wonderful quotes. And then I collected a few of my own that I'm sort of proud of. This is a Willie Nelson quote. Ninety-nine percent of the world's lovers are not with their first choice. That's what makes the jukebox play. <laughs> and I think Hank knew that for sure. <laughs> and then this is my favorite quote in the book in some ways. Um, Robert Kayot, who who is a huge Hank Williams fan, and he was the chancellor at Ole Miss and retired a few years ago. And he's a, a country music enthusiast. In fact, he's played on the stage of the Ryman because his fellow Mississippian and good friend Marty Stewart invited him to sit in with the band one night. But Robert has also played on my front porch, and we've had discussions about Hank many times. But this was when I asked him uh, to contribute a quote for the book. He said, Love is the greatest gift, but music is surely a close second. Combine the two, and you move to the highest level of human experience. And I believe that to be true. What I'd like to do now instead of rambling on is to answer your questions. And uh, it's embarrassing what I'll answer, but (laughs) just feel free. Just shoot away. I'm sorry. I was supposed to wait until she got the microphone. And, you know, you always trot out a new speech to a friendly audience. So (laughs) 
thank you for being so patient with me. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and Christine and I will see that you get a microphone. Speak directly into the microphone. We do have the overflow auditorium, and this is the only way they can hear your question. So who is first? Well, nobody likes to be first, so I always ask myself the first question. <laughs> People always want to know what writers have influenced me, and I go through the litany of, of columnists I have loved. You know, Mike Royko, the great Chicago journalist who's now dead, but he was, you know, a take no prisoners, he, nothing like I write, but I admired him. And I got a chance to meet him once in San Francisco, but I was scared to go over to him, and I didn't know what to say, and so I left. I was scared if he was nice, I'd be disappointed. If he was mean, I'd be devastated. So I just turned and left. So, of course, I wrote about not meeting Mike Royka. <laughs> and he wrote me a, a, a note after that column appeared, and he said, you should have spoken. He said, I would have bowed from the waist and pinched you on the ass. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say Mike Royko, and then people are disappointed when I don't say Faulkner and, you know, and, Though I appreciate the Southern fiction writers, the other people that I say are Raymond Chandler, who wrote things like, she was a blonde to make a bishop kick in a stained glass window. You know, I <laughs> love that kind of thing. And also Hank Williams. And not only did Hank's perfect uh, timing and all of that influence me in some way, I learned words from him. I remember the day when I looked up shackled in the dictionary. I was about 10, I had no idea what it meant, and it was the perfect word. His love was shackled to a memory. And I remember thinking then, what a writer. And so uh, I've answered my first question, somebody else has got to ask one. Did you interview either Hank Jr. or Jet for this book? I interviewed Jet. Uh, Jet and I go back for double net almost. My mother and father live in Pine Level. And when Jet was Kathy and finding out about her history, um, first finding out, she went to a reunion at Jimmy Cook's house, her foster family in Pine Level. And my mother heard about it in the beauty parlor. When well, you're Family is never, ever a good source for column ideas. Just trust me on that. Um, they, they don't do it on purpose, but, I mean, if, if they met uh, Albert Schweitzer, they'd forget to tell me about it, you know. But, but Mother called all excited to her credit, and she said, you'll never believe what I heard in the beauty shop. She said, Hank Williams has a daughter, and she's been to Pine Level. And I'm going, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> but I listened to her, and I called Kathy. And she wasn't ready to talk about it. or he, She had not even met Keith Atkinson, wasn't even pursuing it at that point. But every six months or so, I'd call her back. And, Are you ready? Where, where does it stand? So, yes, I, uh, she's definitely in the book in a big way. I like Jet, and I think uh, she's humble and... Uh, kind and never changes and she's definitely Hank's daughter and uh, I did not interview Hank Jr. I sort of ignored him uh, and I don't say that with malice but I just you know it wasn't part of my plan so and it was my book so I didn't <laughs> Um, I've enjoyed your column for years. Thank you. But it does seem to me that you've changed your style considerably. Not style so much as subject matter. I just loved it when you, you, there was something you could do with a political situation that you could just nail the good old boys. And they, they didn't even know you'd nail them. <laughs> but you've kind of gotten away from that. I, I was wondering why, if, if there's a reason well, I'm nearly 60 years old, and I begin to notice a pattern. Um, every election that came around, you know, at first it was so exciting, and I, I could get passionate about it, but then I, I sort of noticed that not much changes. And I still write about it, mostly when somebody writes and tells me not to write about politics, and then the next one's going to be a political column, uh, come hell or hot water. But... Um, I don't know. I guess it's just getting older, and I, I don't... I alienate half my audience, at least, as soon as I 
weigh in. My politics are not mainstream for the South. And I got tired of the ugly male. You, you're supposed to have thick skin after a while. And I have thick skin, but not in that way. Uh, the older I get, the less I want the, the bother, I guess. I still feel strongly about some political issues, but you give up, I think. You know, you just sort of uh, think, well, what do I know? That's not a good answer, but now I'll write a political call. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think sometimes the news, I don't know about Montgomery, but sometimes the newspapers don't run my political columns. They'll run the hound dogs and the grannies, and if I write a political one, it's missing that week. So, uh, I don't know. You, you're up. Yeah, oh. Over there. Yeah. Um, last year there was a movie that came out. Not very many people saw it about supposedly the last 24 hours in Hank Williams' life, uh -huh. about the ride to Ohio, et cetera. Did you see it? And if you did, what were your thoughts? It was called The Ride, wasn't it? Uh, the Last Ride or The, the Ride, something ride. like that. I have not seen it. I know that Jet had something about it on her newsletter, but I, I've not seen it as, as I try to stress all of that's interesting I find all these biographical tidbits interesting but that wasn't my thesis and not what I was concerned with and I guess I didn't have time to go every direction so I stuck with what I what I was trying to do I'll see it I mean I, I see everything I can about Hank Williams every documentary everything but that wasn't what I needed to inform this book uh, and somebody will uh, uh, be on that case, I'm sure. And this won't be the last book that involves Hank Williams, uh, for certain. Um, I just want to say hello. I feel like um, you're a friend of ours. We Thank you. read your uh, column every week, and over the years have uh, read it. We went to Auburn, my wife and I, and we've appreciated your, your columns over the years. So thanks for that. Um, I wanted to ask you, is there um, any really surprising counterintuitive fact or story that you heard about you Hank in the process of doing this book now I've already heard he he went to some kind of accounting school that would be certainly an eye-opening fact but there's something else that you said you really said I didn't know that and that's really strange well you know I've, I've somehow managed to stay in the newspaper business and have a pretty good job for 35 years and I'm never where the where the breaking news is. I never shock people with stories. I sort of wait till the press conference dust settles before I enter any fray. And I don't know if it's because a lot of it's luck, I think. Uh, but no, this book is not full of solving mysteries and, and uh, that kind of thing. I, I did have one little discovery that I kind of liked. Somebody said they saw him in... Pine Level, eating pickles and pound cake. That he <laughs> that he had some odd eating habits at times. But um, no, it, it's it's not that kind of book. It's not not that kind of book at all. But thanks for the question and thanks for your comment. Yes. I I was wondering if you had the opportunity to hear the uh, CD compilation, The Lost Notebooks. I have. In fact, because several friends knew I was working on this, I got about three copies last, last Christmas, and I got to share them with family and friends. Yes, I enjoyed that very much. And I, I even liked some of the Timeless tribute album. I don't know if you've heard that one. Uh, that's interesting things. And like I say, I got to have a whole year of listening to Hank and Hank music and just semi-related Hank stuff, and nobody could tell me to turn my music down. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Your stories about your friends in Louisiana are so delightful. Thank you. Um, can you share any new stories or tell us where you're spending your time these days? Well, after I sold the Louisiana house, um, I worried and worried about where I would stay when I went back to visit friends. You know, after so long in that area, I knew I would be going back, but I didn't have my little house anymore. So one night, in very depressed mood, uh, I went on eBay and bought a travel trailer for $1,300. And I, I will tell you, there was, there was adult beverage involved in this purchase. <laughs> 
I bid on two travel trailers. And I didn't even notice where they were located. Thank, thank goodness I won the one in Paducah, Kentucky, and not the one in British Columbia. <laughs> so my idea was that I'll have this travel trailer, I'll put my three dogs in it, and I'll go park it in the backyard of anybody in Henderson, Louisiana, who'll have me. And uh, that's not been necessary. I kept the travel trailer. It's been places... But those people are so warm and loving that they almost fight over where you're going to stay when you visit. So um, that that part hasn't been a problem. The problem is finding the time to go and stay for more than a night here and a night there. And every time I go back, I think, well, maybe I made a mistake. I should have sold the place in Iuka, Mississippi. I was really torn about it, but I had more space in Mississippi, and I have dogs, and it's quieter in the hollow, and so anyway, but thanks for asking about that. I was with my friends Jeanette and John L. Lachelet last week, as a matter of fact, so they're, they're doing fine, and um, they're, Helen Boudreau, who was in Poor Man's Provence, is the woman that I was talking about who learned to speak some English by listening to Hank, and She's coming to Alabama on May 19th to Pioneer Park in Lochapoca to to sing Hank and to uh, help me sell books. So, she, so if you get a chance, four to six. <laughs> oh, we took your book and went down and spent a few days in Louisiana, eating a lot of the restaurant, and your house is still there. Oh, good. good. Somebody said they'd painted the porch purple. Is that true? LSU colors. <laughs> really? Okay, well, good. Maybe they rethought. <laughs> well, it, and John L. and Helen and all the characters in Poor Man's Provence are always almost startled, I think, because other people have followed the book and made the rounds, and that is such a wonderful thing to me. Uh, I don't think it's been... I didn't sell enough books so that it's become a problem for the area, but... <laughs> It's not like Provence and, and the the books that have changed that area, but <laughs> thank you for doing that. Okay. Retta. <clears throat> Retta. You've interviewed so many people through the years. Have you ever dreamed that you, you would love to have interviewed him once? Uh, what would you ask him? What questions would you like to ask Hank? Hank Williams. If you had a chance to sit down with him. And, uh... Boy, that's a tough one. You can tell you're a reporter. <laughs> You know, when I admire someone a lot, or when I'm in awe of someone, I almost dread, like Willie. That that interview was tough for me. It was a phone interview, and I dressed for it. I put on my nice... <laughs> Once I got a chance to ask one question of uh, Percy Sledge, and I stood in line, and I had like one minute to ask Percy Sledge a question. And I love the song, When a Man Loves a Woman. So finally I got in front of Percy Sledge, and I said, uh, uh, how many women, do you, young women, do you think lost their virginity to that song? <laughs> I don't know. It just came out. And he, and he said, uh, yeah, he laughed, and he said, that was some fine belly-rubbing music. And, <laughs> So I don't know. I guess I would I would ask Hank something real predictable because I remember, like, where do you get your ideas or something dumb because I would be so awestruck. But that Willie interview, I thought all day long, okay, I've got to ask him something original. It's got to be something nobody... He had written a book, and so all day long he'd been fielding these phone calls. So I, I thought, I'm going to ask him something nobody else has. Well, the phone rang at the appointed time, and I picked it up, and... and and he said, hello, this is Willie Nelson. And I said, oh, my God, Willie, it is you. <laughs> so much for my brilliant question. Yeah. And that's not a very good answer to you, but I can't even imagine that. I mean, that was beyond. I mean, some of his relatives are in this room. So um, I would have just been satisfied to be have been at the Ryman for his Opry debut. That's sort of my dream, and I talk about that in the book. I would have loved to have been there for that. That would have, I could have died happy. You know, that, that would have been something. We have 10 minutes more. Does anyone else have a question? Here's one. This is sort of a, I will bet allergies, so you probably can't hear me. Uh, 
since you want to sell your books and you like jet, we want to invite you down to Georgiana for the annual Hank Williams Festival first weekend in June. I'll be there. Uh, great music Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday night, and I'm Hope's sister, and you can stay at my guest house. <laughs> <laughs> of course you're Hope's sister. <laughs> Gosh, good to see you. Yes, I'll be there. Thank you. <laughs> this is small world time when you come back to Montgomery. I said this on the radio yesterday, but it bears repeating. Uh, James Thurber, this wonderful cartoonist and writer, and uh, I've read several of his autobiographies and also a biography of him. And he went back to his hometown of Columbus, Ohio, and and there was a nice warm crowd like this one. And and he said something that I always think of here. He said, "It's nice to be remembered by a place you can't forget." So that that's how I feel here. I really do. Right here, Sherry. I'd like to ask Miss Johnson uh, how many people in this audience probably spent part of their childhood here in Montgomery because their father was stationed at Maxwell. How many people spent? I don't know. We could ask. Yeah. How many people spent? Their childhood in Montgomery because your father was stationed at Maxwell or your mother. <laughs> no, there's a, there's a couple of others. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, Montgomery was a great place to grow up. Um, I had music lessons from Hazel Etheridge and at Huntington briefly, and it was it was a town full of music, not just Hank Williams' music. There was the Nat King Cole connection, and it was a place where music sort of was in the pores or something. I don't know. My family would go stand around Hank Williams' grave whenever our cousins came from Colquitt, Georgia. They always wanted to go see Hank's grave, and and it was all, it was like he was a relative. And pardon me for saying that, but it felt that way. We we would go stand around, and they would talk about old Hank this and old Hank that. And I remember being shocked when I became a teenager and found out he was only 29 when he died, you know, they, the way they talk of him, it was almost part envy and part pity or something. I don't know. It was, it was a very personal relationship that we all think we had with Hank. Uh, I was born January 30th, 1953, at the end of the month when he died. So, you know, that uh, eliminated any possibility of any real connection or real interview. But I've always felt that just sharing that month in that bizarre way was almost a cosmic connection and maybe part of the reason he's been passionate. I mentioned Mike Royko. Someone asked him once, well, how do you get your ideas? And he said, well, everybody has about five things they feel very strongly about, only five things. He said, you write about those, and then the problem is figuring out what you'll write about the rest of your life. So, so Hank has been almost like a, <clears throat> a recurring character in my columns all these years because I, it's, it's an easy one because I know I please people by just uttering his name. So, uh, And my niece serves somewhat of the same purpose. But I want to, uh, anything else? You or? still have five minutes. Oh, okay. Well, there, here story. comes. Oh, sure. oh, 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 oh okay. <laughs> Hi, Rita. I'm so glad to be here, and it's such a joy to hear your voice and to see all these wonderful fans. Uh, we all feel like family. I know we do. Real quick question. What's next? A dog book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time I think about doing a dog book, uh, I think, no, no, the market's flooded. There have been too many dog books, and then somebody else writes my dog book, and it sells <laughs> a million copies, but... Uh, I do think I'm going to write a, a dog book. And someone said, well, it'll be sad. And I said, of course it'll be sad. The dog always dies. I mean, anybody that read, has read a dog book knows that. Uh -huh. Old Yeller, Dog of Flanders, Call of the Wild, Marley and Me, you name it, the dog dies. So um, I'm going to have several die. So <laughs> figure mine will be a real big hit. <laughs> I hope to keep doing the column. I think now that I'm going to outlive newspapers, uh, <laughs> and I wish that were a joke, but it's, you know, newspapers are disappearing, and I am not high-tech, to say the least. I can't 
seem to reinvent myself by blogging or whatever it's called. So I think probably I'll just, as long as I can, keep writing the column. I like instant gratification. I like books. You have to wait a year. I mean, you know, it's a long process, and you don't see, you don't see it in print right away. So I still feel that my first love is reporting and working, uh, having my work appear in newspapers. And I guess if uh, if every paper is gone before I am. I have had a wonderful ride. Monday's never been like Tuesday. It's been just a terrific uh, way to make a living, is going out and writing about interesting things. I mean, that's, that's, it's not easy. People think it's like a permanent vacation. It's not. But it is good and rich and fun. And um, I have a, a forum to say what I think, whether it's politics or not. And uh, I've been really, truly lucky in that way. I'm um, born in Colquitt, Georgia, grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, moved to Mississippi, worked for a Tennessee paper 14 years, moved back to Georgia. So when people write and say angry things and say, why don't you go back where you belong, I can say, my southern credentials are in order. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm somebody who has moved away from Montgomery, and I really deeply appreciate what you write about the ordinary. And I've moved around a lot like you have. I have a question that you might, I don't know if this will sound familiar, but do you still have your little clay snowmen that you said look like angels in drag? Does this ring a bell to you? Are you Nina? Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. Do you have them? I get them out every year. And some years I don't feel like hauling everything out. Christmas has gotten out of control and, you know, but her sons made these little wonderful pottery snowmen and I was there writing a column about Nina. Bagley, mm -hmm. your father yeah. is mentioned in the book. Are you? Are you yeah. Oh, I'm uh, serious. But her son sold me something that day. <laughs> <laughs> For three dollars a piece. They yeah, it, it, they, these were not cheap. <laughs> And they had twigs for arms, and they get they get a place of honor every year. Nice to see you again. Are you back in Montgomery? Well, oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, nice to see you. Uh, you, you seem to have a love affair with Paris. How does how do you reconcile your southern roots with this exotic love of Paris? Well, I feel like uh, France in general, not so much Paris, but I think the French and Southerners, American Deep South Southerners, have a lot in common. I mean, we obsess about food. We prize beauty. Uh, we sometimes are proud for no good reason. I mean, it, <laughs> there, there are a lot of similarities. <laughs> And, you know, Hank went to Europe, so uh, I, I think it's all right. I, think it, <laughs> I feel that when I write those columns, I always hesitate. I think, this sounds, mm, I've been to Paris again. <laughs> but I don't mean it that way. I just love it so much and have such a good time. And people do respond to those columns in, in one of two ways. And... Uh, <laughs> usually depending on whether they've been. Uh, and, you know, this this total misconception that the French are snooty and mean and don't like Americans, nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, I've seen people reopen kiosks on the side of the road to cook me a sausage on Sunday afternoon. I mean, I've just been treated well there, and I, I do love France. I, I hope to go back again if I, if I sell enough books. <laughs> Uh, yes, I went. I went to um, uh, Robert E. Lee High School. I was born in 1953 too, and uh, <clears throat> I, my, I grew up with my mother and father and aunts and uncles. We they played Hank Williams songs on the weekend and danced, and we listened to the Grand Ole Opry. And I loved music. Period. And I just wondered if you ever went into the, any of the big BAM shows that they had here with all these musics that. I talk about the big BAM shows and the fact that Hank played at the opening of Garrett Coliseum. And um, my mother heard early on in our, when we moved to Montgomery, and the big BAM, she heard about the big BAM shows. And she heard that 
people did heavy petting in the rafters. <laughs> I never was allowed. <laughs> I was never allowed to go to a big band show. And look how well I turned out. <laughs> but if you went to Lee, Ellen Dudley uh, was part of my musical memories, and she's featured in the book, and uh, I loved her. She said when we'd sing off-key, Ellen Dudley would look out at us, and she was head of the Glee Club at Lee, and she'd say, you sound like a Baptist congregation on Easter morning. (laughs) (laughs) So I hope there are a lot of fun Montgomery tidbits in, in the book like that. I had fun writing this book. I mean, writing's never easy. It's but for once, I enjoyed the agony of writing. I mean, it was finally I got to write about something I wanted to write about, and it, it was it was a great a great uh, ride. Thank you so much. Thank you. Rita will be right here if you have more questions for her or if you uh, would like for her to sign your book. Please turn in your evaluation forms as you leave. Thank you.